The meeting will begin in one minute. The meeting will begin in one minute. Thank you. Make room. Welcome everyone to your Sioux Falls City Council informational meeting of Tuesday, January, or May 24th, 2016. Yeah, where I skipped a few months, I guess. Uh, but thank you all for being here both on TV and uh, in the audience. Uh, we'll uh, start with our first order of business, which is open discussion. Anything for open discussion? Seeing none, oh, Mr. Uh, Councillor Nicer, I'll have to get used to this. Just yeah, a second. thank you very much. I want to bring up the uh, administration building again. Um, I'm worried that there's just not any momentum at this point to look at other options, and I'd like to see some. I asked about it last week, and there was really no response. So I guess I just want to know what we're doing in terms of maybe public discussions or you know informationals to look at other options and uh, discuss where we go. Um, yes, Councillor Urbanbach. I would just encourage the Councillor to uh, take the leadership role on that. You know, there's Council members here now that um, voted on it and, and that was where it sat. And so I guess if it's going to change, it's going to have to come out of this Council. It's not going to change on its own. Right. You know, and I don't mean it in a negative way. I'm just saying, let's go. If you want to do it, let's go. Perhaps I can uh, leave, uh, let's leave some uh, insight, give you some insight on this. I am meeting with uh, uh, Councillor Kylie and I are meeting next week with the uh, um, committee uh, to go over uh, buildings that are being vetted. They've, they've done that and we're going to be getting some information and I will report to you next week as soon as that meeting is over as to what, uh, not decisions, but what information we've been given. Uh, I promised all of you and the ones that uh, left that I would stay on top of this. I have done that. I've been uh, calling Sue Etten, uh, Quambeck about every two weeks, find out what's going on. And so the meeting is scheduled for next week, and I will be getting back to you. Would that be sufficient at this point? Yeah, that, that's helpful. And I would say that um, I am thinking about things I could do, but I wanted to see where we were at, and uh, I, I will take initiative. Thank you. Right, right. Um, and that's solely up to you and wholly up to you. And so, but I would encourage you to wait until the information that, I, that I'm gonna be getting uh, is, is disseminated so that you've got all of it rather than uh, some of it and we double up on work. Fair enough. Okay. Yes, Councilor Stina. Having, uh, oh, excuse me. Having come off the campaign trail, I know this was a, a, a you know, contentious or popular item to discuss with the citizens. Yep. And uh, we were talking about the 20, 21, 25 million dollar price tag, and we're talking about streets, and we're talking about options. And what I would like to throw out to the group is, could we um, look at having a town hall meeting, and maybe partnering with some media venues? Have and this has been done in the past. In fact, I remember when the Argus Leader did it. I think about the event center several years ago. And get get the public involved to say what do you what, what does the public think about this? And one of the things as I was running, I want what that I wanted to do was to bring more public input into all of the issues that we're dealing with. So I would like to step forward and, and get the ball rolling on that. But if what I'm willing to listen to what we think. Yeah, I I. I I, can't, I can agree with you, but again, we need to wait for the information. If we have a town hall meeting now, or we have something like that, or the media goes ahead and has something like that, we're gonna be doing it with partial information. So let's get all the information together. I promise you it's not gonna be um, 
September 30th when everything comes together. Well, no, and we got to do it quickly, and that's why I've been on the on the horn calling, and uh, we'll get that information to you, and then we can start making some better decisions. And maybe for, maybe instead of that, we would have a uh, um, a meeting with us for the. Um, uh, as uh, as a um, working session or something like that to see how we can bring some people in that we want to talk to about it. So we've got a lot of opportunities, a lot of ideas, and I just I'm just going to caution that we wait until this information comes in so that we know we've got the information we need to make a decision. I hope that makes some sense. Yeah, but I think we need to be, be having something happening. Like I was thinking, if we did a little town hall get together, and I mean, it could even be down at the library. It could be at the Orpheum, just to just to you know, listening and learning on our part for the council. The mayor does it all the time, and then get some feedback, you know, from the public. Probably needs to happen in June because whatever decision is made, we're going to have to. You should have plenty yeah. of time to make that mm -hmm. decision because my meeting is June first. And so you'll have a okay. report on it okay. either that day or the next day, and then we can uh, look at what steps we want to take from there. Well, and another thing, if I could also say, what would be the possibility of having this go to a public vote? There are all kinds of things that, that, that could happen with that. That would have to be something that either we would vote on or um, a petition drive would have to be a, re a referral. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. A uh, referral could happen. But the council could also have an action to. I think we could have a uh, vote if we wanted, uh, but it would not be binding. If I'm not mistaken, it would be like the event center vote that we had, whether it be for out out at the current site or downtown. So um, I think again, Councilor Staley, those are the things that we need to discuss. But again, let's get the information gathered first and then we can discuss it again and, and go forward with the plan. Okay? Okay, anything else for um, uh, open discussion? Hearing none, let's go ahead with our presenters, uh, Bill O'Toole, on the uh, amendments to our code of ordinance for chapter 39, personnel res uh, regulations and benefits, retirement and pensions. Bill. Good afternoon, Council. Bill O'Toole, Human Resources Director. Uh, just. To get everybody's frame of uh, reference regarding these issues, um, uh, initially we brought this forward in an informational on 419 uh, of last month at an informational. We had first reading as well uh, that evening. And as this council knows, uh, on 5-3, uh, the matter was deferred. And given the transition that was going on, it was uh, wise to refer this back for another informational discussion and presentation uh, before the second reading that's going to occur on June 14th. So with that, I'm happy to uh, review the changes with this council, and I'd be happy to answer any questions as we're moving along uh, uh, the presentation. Uh, and as I have done before, uh, I characterized the changes uh, throughout Chapter 39 of these personnel regulations as either uh, just kind of housekeeping type matters uh, we do have some substantive changes, uh, and uh, we also have changes that uh, I would categorize as adding the protected class of gender identity uh, throughout the, the personnel ordinances uh, as a result of uh, the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance Regulation uh, that requires uh, all contractors with the federal government uh, to have an equal opportunity clause in their contracts. Uh, and, and it says it must include sexual orientation and gender identity as part of the, pr the prohibited classes. And given the regulations and the advice of the city attorney, we wanted to go through and update the, or the ordinances uh, with that. No. Okay, thank you. You're fine. All right, we'll see. Is that working any better? So throughout, uh, and I won't go through each one of those, I just wanted to give the setup uh, for those changes, um, and we'll, we'll move through these fairly fast. But again, if the council has any questions uh, about what's in front of you, please feel free to ask. Uh, the first uh, highlight is, is among those areas of, of kind of house cleaning, of, of clarifying the definition of an appointed officer uh, throughout the city of Sioux Falls, um, uh, just to provide more clarity, and we wanted to ensure that uh, it was no issues with respect to understanding the definition also included uh, any medical appointed staff 
uh, and mayor appointed staff that may not be subject to advice and consent of the city council. Uh, in 39.005, again, just a simple uh, change and clarification, uh, workers' compensation now is a function of the Human Resources Office as opposed to essential services, so a very straightforward change uh, in that provision. Uh, same thing in, in um, the scope uh, is simply deleting outdated terminology. And, and this section did uh, have some questions in 39.038 regarding political activity. Uh, we are recommending that this provision uh, be repealed. Again, this is through uh, the advice and consultation with the city attorney's office. Uh, we can appreciate uh, the discussion that has, uh, that has accompanied this provision. Uh, we understand uh, what it's there, but at the end of the day, uh, you're trying to get that balance between the sanctity of the civil service system, campaign finance reform, uh, and protection of uh, free speech uh, issues. And again, upon the advice of the city attorney, we're recommending this be repealed. This discrimination section, again, just adding gender identity uh, to the list of protected classes. Uh, in 39.047, uh, preference for uh, military personnel, there was a change in the legislature last year regarding the hiring uh, of, of veterans and, and providing preference for uh, veterans. So what we're trying to do is just create language that uh, mirrors uh, or uh, says that we're gonna follow state law. Uh, and really what's happened uh, with the last changes is uh, there is a, a new requirement that if a veteran meets the minimum qualifications uh, of the position that they've applied for that they are entitled to an interview. In 39.048, uh, again, we're just deleting some outdated terminology. And in 39.059, uh, no real change here. We've just, via this, this particular uh, ordinance, have just reconstructed it, if you will, so we think it reads better uh, and it's cleaner. So again, just some house cleaning. Uh, same thing with uh, 39.060. Uh, we're just simply uh, adding uh, some clarification language with respect to the provision and 39.062 is, again, just adding gender identity. Uh, same thing with 39.063. And then the next two provisions in 39.069 and 070 uh, are dealing with uh, our uniform police and fire positions. Um, and what we're doing here is establishing uh, policy with respect to the application process and the retirement process. Um, and what we're uh, suggesting is that uh, is setting a floor and a ceiling for our public safety uh, application process. Uh, currently, the job descriptions right now require that you be age 21. Uh, and, and what we've done here is we've added a provision that also sets a ceiling uh, that you must be no greater than age 44 uh, at the age of the time of the entrance for the civil service examination process. Uh, we've consulted extensively with legal and with the chiefs uh, with respect to this provision and the subsequent one as well. Uh, and, and they're uh, uh, very supportive of this and, and they're, they're here as well in case you have any questions uh, as it relates to that provision. Uh, the 39.070, the mandatory retirement for uniform police and fire positions. Um, if this council will remember, uh, we made some changes uh, a couple of years ago uh, where newly hired um, employees uh, now become members of the South Dakota retirement system that was made in 2014. Uh, and prior to that, uh, the city's current pension system has mandatory retirement in it. And what we wanna do is we wanna be consistent with our approach uh, to our uh, police and firefighters. And we really believe it's a good policy position for the city to be in uh, and to require uh, age 60 as a mandatory retirement for those occupations. They're very unique uh, in the type of work that they do, uh, the demands of the job, uh, and in fact, there's a specific exemption from the Age Discrimination and Employment Act that allows for this to happen because it is a bona fide occupational qualification uh, and does not present uh, any age issues or age discrimination uh, type claims. Uh, and I'd also add that we've also did some analysis over the last five years and we looked at the average age of retirement for both the police officers and the firefighters. Uh, and the reality is based on that data, uh, it was either age 53 or 54 right in that category, they weren't anywhere near that age 60 criteria. Uh, so from an experience standpoint, we just don't see this as, as being an issue. And it's certainly not uncommon for uh, public sector organizations um, 
to have these kind of provisions in place. Uh, the next provision, uh, again, this is just uh, outdated language uh, and, and deleting some language that no, no longer applies to the processing. And in 39.123, the reassignment and salary uh, changes. Uh, rather than get into the weeds uh, on this particular issue uh, at, at a high level, uh, all we're trying to do is, is clarify and provide consistency uh, for the manner in which we're handling uh, reassignment and salary changes uh, for some of our personnel. Uh, in 39.168, jury duty and witness fees. Um, the way it currently reads uh, is that if uh, an employee uh, has to perform jury, jury duty uh, or receive witness fees, they provide us the check and we deduct it from their, uh, from their paycheck. And we think it's a much more efficient process to not be in the business of making the deduction. We want to change that where all they do is they simply turn over the check um, to the city of Sioux Falls. And it's just a much more seamless process and it's much more efficient. Under the family medical leave provision in 39.165, looks like we're deleting a lot of information. The reality is all we're doing here is, again, some housekeeping information that it simply says we're gonna, we're gonna follow the Family Medical Leave Act and we're just striking some, some unnecessary language. Under the vacation leave provision in 39.180 in sec subsection D, uh, we're simply adding um, some flexibility to um, our hiring uh, processes uh, and we're asking to add uh, that appointed officers be added to the, this list so that when we're hiring management or appointed position, it gives us more flexibility to negotiate uh, vacation accrual packages based on years of experience. Um, for example, in this scenario, it's, it's identifying uh, the ability to uh, make an offer of uh, begin accruing the vacation accrual at the monthly level of 10 hours per month. That's the equivalent of three weeks per year. Uh, it's just not uncommon to engage in that practice. So we're just simply adding uh, a point of officer to this list. And the last section, uh, again, uh, just a housekeeping kind of situation uh, and clarifying that, that under the use provision in 39.182, uh, adding that the, de the department director or designee shall designate. Um, and the reason we, we do that, because there's a previous uh, uh, provision that says any reference to the director usually assumes the HR director. So again, just housekeeping. Uh, and with that, that concludes the, the list of changes. If there's any questions from the council, I'll be happy to answer them. I would uh, entertain some questions. Uh, Councilor Nicer. It, is it typical in um, for employers to require that employees uh, pay their uh, jury duty pay to their employer? Just an open question. Is it typical? Um, I, you know, I guess I, I don't have an answer for that, Counselor. Uh, I, I can tell you this: this provision obviously is has been in place for uh, a very long period of time. Um, You're just changing the mechanics of how it's collected. Changing the mechanics of how it's done okay. and making it, make it a little more seamless. Does uh, this? I know this came up before, but I, I do wonder if the age of 44 might preclude good candidates, you know, like maybe you have a detective who's 45 who wants to come into the department. I'm, you know, I'm coming up on 38 in six years, my life isn't over. So I, you know, and, and is that something that obviously this has apparently been vetted through the attorneys, that's not gonna be, is that a bona fide, that it's not gonna be an age discrimination issue? We have looked at that. Uh, we've had, and I don't know if Dave Feifley is here, uh, he is, if you want to ask this question, they, they did vet that uh, and, and there have been organizations that have been challenged on that and it's, it's been found, it's been upheld uh, okay. from a legal perspective that it's, it's certainly entitled to do that. And, and like I said, when you think about uh, the tenures, the rigors of the job um, for those individuals, uh, we think it's just, it's a good, pol it's good public policy to pr put those provisions in place. One more, Councilor Nicer. One more. Um, does that apply to only uniformed officers or would that apply to, let's say, somebody working in a crime lab? It would not apply to the, to the crime lab situation. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Councilor Kiley. Uh, as far as addressing, I can address part of Councilor Neitzert's uh, question about is it, do you have to, is it common for an employee to pay back their fees they collected during jury duty. In my previous job, yes. 
I had to do that. Uh, otherwise, you're getting paid twice by your employer as well as by uh, the court system. So we had to do that. Um, and also, I had asked previously the same question about the 44 and then the mandatory 60, and if that's commonplace in other departments, fire and police around the country, and I do believe that you had responded that, yes, it is a common practice. Yeah, I, I would certainly say it's, it's, not, it's not uncommon uh, that right. you see that. And, and before this, again, we had age 21, the minimum. That was always present. That's a requirement of the law enforcement standards for, for uh, uh, police officers. It's been in the job description for firefighters. Uh, we simply uh, I decided to add the cap. Uh, and I, I don't know, if, if Jane, if you have any additional insight into the discussions you guys have had with respect to um, the 40, age 44, and again, that means as, as long as you're not age 45, you're, you're still in the, in the picture. Anything else to add in terms of the discussion? Yeah, and under, and under the, the city's, the current um, city's pension system, you know, we have a, there was a 15-year vesting requirement um, for public safety officers. So when you think about that uh, range, uh, you're kind of getting pretty close to being at that point. Obviously, it's different in SDRS, but in the current city's pension system, it's Plus, that gives years. adequate time to accumulate funds for payment of retirement benefits. Other questions? Uh, Councilor Erickson first. She had her hand up first. Thanks. Um, just two quick questions. Um, is our ordinance, does it define gender identity in this ordinance anywhere? It does not, but I'll give you one. And I just would be curious which definition we are using, because I believe there's 70 some definitions of gender identity. Or maybe it's not gender identity, there's several definitions. So I'm just curious which one we're using and where we got it from. The, un, under the federal uh, requirements, the gender identity is, is uh, defined as, it refers to one's internal sense of one's own gender. It may or may not correspond to the sex assigned to a person at birth and may may or may not be visible to others. Okay, and then my other question, if I can follow up too along the same lines, um, what other South Dakota cities have um, this as a protected class? Or are I, there We, we any did not other? do any of that research to know if there are other cities. And if there's any nearby, just for simple information. David. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dave Fifley with the City Attorney's Office. Councilor Erickson. Uh, Brookings and Watertown and the city of Sioux Falls have sexual orientation as a protected class. I believe we would be the first city, to the best of my knowledge, that would have gender identification specifically in our ordinances. Uh, internally, we've had an executive order for some months that specifically states gender identity is included in the protected classes. Uh, since about 2011, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has directed us as a contracting agency with them that the term gender or sex includes both sexual orientation and gender identification as protected classes. And we have been processing claims in the employment arena under those specific protected classes, even though specifically our, our ordinance does not say uh, gender identification and so forth. So the de Sorry, yes. Mr. Chair. Um, the definition that was read, is that is that in federal government? Is it in state statute? What I just am curious about the exact definition because I am getting contacted by people that give me 20 different definitions and I didn't know which one we were using, so I just well, was curious. In terms of a generally accepted use, I think what Bill read you was, was the generally accepted definition and we would certainly refer to the employment arena <laughs> In terms of the definition, it's both formulated by case law as well as by you know, the federal regulations with Title VII to the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. Five circuit courts of appeal at the federal level have all ruled that the term gender includes sexual orientation and gender identification. And so we would follow all that in terms of processing anything internally. And just so the council is aware, this. Uh, is only a codification of a practice that's already being done by executive order and it's also applying only to internal city hiring, promotion, 
uh, practices. It would not apply externally. This is our own personnel regulations. By charter, the city council adopts the provisions regarding the civil service rules. We already have an executive order. This is just amplifying that to make it perfectly clear that this will continue and we're asking for your blessing as a city council, as the policymakers, that, that this process can continue. So do we need it then if it's already an executive order? Yes, we do, Councillor. I believe we do. Just so there's complete clarification that that's one of the protected classes within uh, city employment practices, so there's no question. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. Councillor Staley. Oh, um, I'm going back to uh, the political activity uh, item. and just for the sake of those of us who are new, um, would you clarify that people uh, employed by the city can participate in PACs? That is right, they, they can give as, as a, and spouses of, of employees can also, as it stands now, contribute, right, correct? Yes, good questions, Councilor Staley, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Councilor Staley, yes, in terms of the charter, section 702, you are correct, it provides that uh, city employees spouses may contribute to municipal candidates and also the elected officials are exempt uh, from the uh, campaign contribution ban so yes you are correct and can I just make a comment that I have been you know, visiting with different people about this specific part of this and it's come up the example of, of the governor's race and that within the state they don't have this at this time and that there there seems to be uh, somewhat of there can be a pressure on on his staff his cabinet to contribute to to his campaign so the, to me i like the idea of not having that <clears throat> at uh, an issue for our, our employees here that that's just weighing in a little other comments questions Councilor Erpenbach. Question, um, Attorney Fifely, talk about um, whether, because Councilor Erickson has a, a valid question, should we be codifying the um, definition of gender identity as well as the fact that it's a protected class? All of our other protected classes are not defined in this ordinance, Councilor. We would again refer to the uh, federal laws and as defined by case law and by EEOC reg regulation in terms of what those protected class definitions are. I think those are generally accepted in the employment arena, and I don't see a need to clarify every definition of a protected class and in if, our ordinance. If I might, Mr. Chair, um, could you then help me? I've been, uh, I've received many of the same input that the other members of the council have. I've been deeply offended by them uh, because they have taken this so out of context. It's, it's kind of embarrassing to those folks because they're not reading nor understanding. They're just regurgitating something that's been fed to them. So I just wonder if you would remind us again why we're doing this and how this might affect the bathrooms at public places like the mall. Will, it, will this ordinance change who can go to the bathroom in a particular place in the mall? Uh, number one, this is not about transgender bathrooms. This is internal city employment practices only. This is not dealing at all with places of public accommodation. It is, uh, that is way beyond the scope of what this ordinance is doing. This is internal policies only. You as a city council are merely codifying a practice already in place that we will not discriminate in terms of city employment positions on the basis of gender, including sexual orientation, which has been there for about eight years and this merely adds gender identification, which is now seen as a protected class in the employment arena. I think really, if I might just make one comment, one it really goes to that idea that the only way that you can get fired if you're a city employee is by not doing your job. It's not who you are or who you believe yourself to be. It is that you're not doing a good job, and, and yeah, you could get fired for that, but we're not gonna discriminate based on other things. And so I guess that's the basics of this, and I just really want folks to understand this. I suppose I'm gonna get beaten up over it, but for heaven's sake, this is not about bathrooms. This is about employees. Thank you. Councilor Starr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Dave, probably for, for you more than anything. Um, 
we've been talking about the uh, the election. So one of the things that we did in this past election was Amendment F to the Charter, where we codified uh, sexual orientation as a protected class. Over 75% of the people who voted in this last election voted in favor of adding that to the Charter. So as a city councilor, would I not be required to uphold the uh, charter like I swore to a week ago, even my memory lasts that long, um, to include this as part of our internal hiring practices? Correct, Councilor Starr. And again, charter would trump any ordinance anyway, so it's already in charter. But again, the sexual orientation component. But the ordinance already had sexual orientation in it, and that was added, I think, in about 2008. So we've... The charter amendment reflected what the voters' view was on it, but more importantly, it just codified what was already done by a former council in terms of sexual orientation is a protected class within city employment. Can I follow up one more? I mean, one more. In a, a separate uh, vein, when we talk about political activity for our city employees, are we not governed by the Hatch Act as well as some of the <laughs> other, um, and how does that differentiate? Because the Federal Hatch Act deals with only federal employees. It does not deal with state employees. And the Hatch Act deals with active participation by federal employees in campaign activity. But to the best of my knowledge, it does not deal with campaign contributions. It's only active participation with, with certain uh, political organizations. But That's it is, nice. I think, Councilor Starr, you are correct that it certainly is something to look at in terms of a model for how we should go about things. Councilor Nicer. I approach this question with a lot of trepidation, but since people keep asking me this, um, 39042, no person in the civil service or seeking admission thereto shall be appointed, reduced, or removed, and then here's the key part, or in any way favored or discriminated against because of, and then we're adding gender identity. Would you consider um, the bathroom one chooses to use based on their gender identity, could that be a discrimination? I can't disclose, but we have dealt with that issue, Councillor Neitzert, in terms of uh, city internally, and we've able, been able to resolve that uh, successfully. Does that mean we have a policy in place already? We do not have a written policy, no, we do not. Should we? I don't believe so. Would this change how our policy? No, it does not. As I've stated, for the last five years, we have been interpreting the term gender to include sexual orientation and gender identity so already. So would, would this deal with bathrooms then or not? No, it would not. So discrimination, being, you can't be discriminated against based on the bathroom that you may choose to use? I'm not sure I'm understanding where you, what well, it you're says, asking. It says counseling. discriminated against. I'm just asking if your choice of bathroom comes into play with your gender identity. Again, that's not in terms of employment, in terms of hiring or promotions or anything of that nature. That's this is only for employment. hiring and employment. When I, when I read discriminated against, it's not. Well, you gotta read the whole uh, in clause in terms of appointed, reduced, removed, or discriminated against because of their including these protected classes. Okay, it, it just seems odd that, for example, you know, I, I can't be discriminated against for purposes of hiring, but once I'm hired, I could be discriminated against? No, if that I was... would have included how you are treated as a city employee. Okay. Uh, if no one else has something, has anything, I have a couple. Um, and mine are going to be different, different, so you can sit down, David. <laughs> You said, um, Bill, 53, 54 is the average uh, age of retirement for police and fire? Yes. Somewhere in there? I don't remember which fell where, but the point, you get the point, yeah. that, that they're and retiring I, on average at, 50, at, at that point in time, which is nowhere near the yeah. age 60 provision. What's the age and, um, age and years of service um, formula So it says they can retire is at 85? Uh, for for the firefighters, uh, there is a rule of 80, it's a combination of your years of service and, and age. Uh, if that equals 80, that's where that hits most of the firefighters. Um, and the other provision is escaping me right now. Do you do you have that, Jane? That's that that hits most of them. Uh, and the and the police officers. Um, and again, I don't have I apologize. I don't have that information right in front of me, Counselor. Is it better for us to hold on to the people that would be? that would hit that 80 and per 
you know, some of them can retire at 55 or even earlier than that at that point. If we're saying that 60 you have to retire, are we also saying that 60 is a good age to retire when you, you should be able to do your job up until that time? And so we're encouraging people to retire early that could possibly um, uh, be very beneficial to the uh, city of Sioux Falls in their, you know, tender, in their, in their longevity, in the knowledge that they have, et cetera, et cetera, and are dangling a carrot out there for them so large that they can't afford not to take it at the earlier ages. And maybe that's what we want to do. Well, and, and, and in all honesty, Council, I think that is uh, some of the setups when you look at various public sector plans that, that allow them to retire at earlier ages. That is a recognition, uh, again, based on the, the, the occupation itself and the physical demands that go with it. Uh, and that as a, as a universal position or a universal policy, that probably has application in most situations. Now, does that mean that somebody who is the age of 60 or 60 and a half or 61 or 62, that they could never do the job? I don't think the answer to that is no, that doesn't mean that. But we're, what we're saying is a matter of policy. Uh, that's probably good public uh, policy to do those things in light of those physical demands that go with those occupations because we need to recognize uh, those life safety issues that they're performing and, and recognize the fact that with age comes some issues that, that, that do hinder your ability to do that. It would seem to me that we might, with that early age of retirement, that we might look at different um, age years of service formulas at different times of hire. I don't know if that's ever crept into your mind. In other words, a, a guy that's 20 years old, you know, he's got 50 and he's got 30, he's 50 years old, he's 21, 51 years old, and he can retire. Um, maybe that should be set up to 55, ma maximum re, uh, work age of 55 instead of, instead of 60. From 45 to 21 to 45, there should be a graded, graded area in there. Just an idea, because I, I hate to lose these people from that standpoint. Uh, I think you know, a, a detective can probably be very effective um, from age uh, 51 through 60. And, 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 I, and I you would agree with me 100%. I certainly I understand what you're saying, Councilor. And so and maybe that's an idea we could look at as, as doing a grading effect. I won't, I won't go on anymore. What happens on um, jury duty witness if they uh, forget to sit, sign the check over to us? Do we take it, out of their, take it out of the check at that point, or do we ask them to write us a personal check? Uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't been ever confronted with a situation. We usually get cooperation because I think there's a recognition that, that what we do as an employer is very supportive for that activity. And obviously, it's a much better situation that they receive their, their pay uh, through the city of Sioux Falls right. than, than the dollars that they get on the other side of the equation. Uh, and, and we've not had any issues with that. Okay. Okay. Um, include appointment revision laws. To negotiate and advance your case. Oh. This uh, 10 hours per month of vacation accrual, uh, 39,180. Yes. Um, 10 hours a, a month forever, that can be accumulated? Uh, yeah, if you look at the schedule right up above there, Counselor, you can see that the monthly accrual levels um, coincide with years of service. Uh, and in this particular provision, you know, you can see 10 is in that category of five, but less than 10. And then it incrementally increases up to 16.75 at the Got max. It, I'm sorry. So with 19, but less than 20, they get, they get basically uh, three and a half weeks off or something like that. Yeah, and I don't have, let me see if I have the. Well, 15 would be 15 hours uh, or 15, that would 16 be, days. That would be five weeks, counselor. That'd be 201 hours. It says 19, but less than 20 is 16.75. Per month, so you take that times 12, that'd be 201 hours or five weeks. So five weeks after, after um, 20. After 19, after, then, after 19, 19, but less than 20, got it. that's the max. You that can accrue with the city forever? of Falls. Yes. It accumulates? As long as, as, long as you're with the city of Falls, it, it's capped at 280 hours. If that, I think that may have been that's where you were going. That's what I wanted to do, which is, uh, approximately 10 weeks, 11 or 12 weeks, somewhere in there. Yeah, they have yeah. 201, 201 That's, that's the answer I, I yeah. wanted to make sure I was there with. 
Okay, um, I believe that's all I have. Anything else from? I was Council just going to comment on a couple of your comments, if I that's, don't know that if I can that's allow allowed. <laughs> uh, I, I think Bill had already mentioned that uh, historically, individuals are retiring well before their 60th birthday, and you said the average was again. That 53, 54 uh, time period. Uh, let me see if I can find that. So, so I'm just pointing out that the 60 seems to be taking care of itself by the individuals that are most likely, I mean, that are directly involved. And then in, in terms of um, tinkering with the retirement formula, that is part of the negotiated agreement between the two actually, the groups, the, I'm assuming. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you, Counselor. Um, the, that actually will be governed by the South Dakota retirement system right. from this point forward for new retirees. It's not subject to negotiations, nor was, was uh, pensions subject to negotiations because they were preempted by the fact that the ordinance uh, already existed for city employees. Uh, and I do have the statistics. The, the police officers, the average age of retirement is 54. Uh, the average age for retirement for fire was 53, again, based on the last five years worth of data that we looked at. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we need to move on here. So hearing no other um, uh, questions, I would entertain a motion to uh, enter into executive session consulting with our legal counsel or reviewing communications from legal counsel about proposed or pending litigation or contractual matters per South Dakota codified law 1-25-23 and preparing for contract negotiations and negotiating with employee or employee, uh, employer uh, employees or employee representatives, South Dakota codified law 1-252-4. So moved. And a second. Uh, with that, we will move into executive session. I would ask everyone to leave the uh, um, chambers. <laughs>